Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We have here today this beautiful lady, Jumana Haddad, a Lebanese author, public speaker, journalist, and women's rights activist. She has a very strange subject, living in a country that hates you. Jumana, why would you choose a subject like that? Or was it given to you? Well, it was, first of all, thank you for interviewing me. Thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, I'm thrilled again to be at, at the festival and to discover this beautiful land. Mm -hmm. uh, the title is in fact uh, from, taken from an article about me that was published some time ago in The Guardian. And it's about what does it mean to be a woman's rights activist, a secular activist in a country where there's so much discrimination and so much confessionalism. But have you felt any discrimination? Of course, you of have. course. Ever since I was born and started having some kind of consciousness, there's a lot of um, discrimination uh, against women in Lebanon, even though, you know, there's this cliche or stereotype about Lebanon that it's... Beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful doesn't mean that it's not discriminative. There's this image that Lebanon is way better than other Arab countries, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's only the appearance, you know, uh, when when you speak about emancipation, when you speak about freedom, when you speak about equality, there are certain standards that need to be there. And the first of those standards is that you should feel like a citizen in your own country and not as a second degree citizen. You don't? And no, not just me. Most women do not feel, those who are aware of this injustice do not feel like, because the laws that apply to me are different than the laws that apply to the man. Mm -hmm. uh, and even between different religions, the, the laws that apply to, a, to people from a certain religion are different, which makes Lebanon, even though it's such a small, small country, so divided. Because we have not learned to have one identity. And that is why there is this feeling of being hated. You know, I have, I have been, it's a, it's a love-hate relationship that I've had with Beirut. But the love is there as well. Even if there's hatred, there's is, also is the a lot of love and support. Is the division between the genders or is it between... Uh different classes of people, what, what is it? I, I actually don't believe in division between genders because even if we talk about patriarchy, it's not only men that uh, compose a patriarchal system. It's made of men and women who have a certain type of thinking and who are convinced that men are the superior. better or superior to women. And there are yeah. lots of women who believe that. So, but the divis divisions in Lebanon are most of all religious. You mm. know, we are 18 different communities and each community has its different law that applies to, to, its, the, to the members of that community. And this makes us not identify or belong to one feeling or one land or one identity. People belong to their religions rather to, mm -hmm. than to uh, their land, you know, or their country. So practically speaking, now you're talking about it here, when you go back home, would you have any reaction from any party or official or gender, anything that Oh, happens? I have my, my daily dose of insults <laughs> and, uh, you know, threats. But that's not a problem. I learned, I'm 48 years now, I yeah. have learned with time to focus on the positive. You need to focus, you need to see and recognize the positive. And this is what I learned. There are lots of people who feel that I'm voicing their concerns that I'm saying the things that maybe their conditions or circumstances do not allow them to say, and they feel revenged by me. Even if I do not seek 
that revenge for them. I'm just being myself. I'm just practicing my right to be who I am without leading a double life. And double lives are very common in so Lebanon there, and in the Arab countries. So there's a love-hate relationship. Yes. Now I'll leave you alone. No, so don't. That don't leave me alone. If you leave me alone, I'm going to talk with them. I hate monologues. I don't like to speak alone. I like to always give and take with people. So if you go, they will start asking me questions. They have to ask you yes, questions. That's they what have. it's all about. I want about. to hear your questions. Are there questions in the public? There will be, definitely. Yes. But first, uh, I think they would like to know a little more about you. Yeah. Where were you born and what are you doing and all about your parents and then how it came into your mind that you are an independent-minded young lady. Mm -hmm. All those sort of questions will come from there, but okay. at the moment, yeah. Okay, so I was born in Beirut, uh, Lebanon, uh, in 1970. And the war in Lebanon, there was a very um, violent civil war in Lebanon that started in 1975 and lasted till 1990, which means from the moment I was five, five years, years old, old till I was 20 years old, which means everything I remember from my childhood and teenage years is something that I would love to forget. It's not... It's not a period of my life that I particularly cherish or remember with joy or even with tenderness. Because when you grow up in a war, there's a lot to, um, that you have to live with, like the idea of losing your loved ones at any moment or your own life. It's about hearing you know, the bombs every day, running to shelters, uh, to filthy shelters, most of all, um, uh, living with the fear. Uncomfortable homes. Yeah. No food? Uh, no, there was rationing of food, electricity, and I am from a, from a very modest family, so we had our own struggles as well. Uh, many of the more comfortable families managed to leave the country during the war and go to live in Europe, but we never had that uh, luxury. But at the same time, you know, I had a very difficult um, uh, and, uh, let's say, challenging uh, childhood and adolescence. But it made me very much closer to books because books were my revenge from life, from what was happening. This is what... I was running away to books. Yeah. Help me, save me, give me something else, let me forget what is happening around me. And this is what they did indeed. So I owe so much to literature, so much. I think a lot of the person that I am today, I owe to, to the readings that I did as a child and, and teenager. So when then did you decide to start writing? It's not a decision. It was something that came very, um, let's say, spontaneously to me when I was like 10 or 11. I started writing um, stories for kids, stories for children. Mm. And then when I was 12, I wrote my first poem. And since then, I haven't stopped writing, even though my parents wanted me to become a doctor. They always said, you should study medicine. And I did indeed go to med Same school here. <laughs> for two years. And yeah. then I told them, no more. I will be a failure as a doctor. I yeah. want to become a Same writer here. and a journalist. Do you remember the poem or do you have it uh, I, I on rem you? I don't have it with me, but I remember it. I have it at home, but I remember the title. Can what? you imagine? It was Freedom. Freedom, freedom, the word freedom. I was writing about my freedom. Yeah. Because this is how you feel. You feel in a cage when you grow up in war. And when you grow up also in a society that looks at you as a lesser being. So You mean there, due to poverty? No, not, not just due to, to poverty. As, as due a kid, to the fact, as a child. Yeah, of course. Because they always tell the boys and the family, they always encourage them to have careers. When you grow up, you will be this and you will be that. Mm. I'm not talking about my parents. Fortunately, I grew up 
with um, a dad that loved to read and encouraged me to read and to and to study, and a mother who have who has struggled a lot in her life in, and sacrificed a lot of the things that she should have in order for me to have a good education. Were you an only but, child? No, I have a brother, Shadi. They but didn't let me look, tell you, look upon him as special. They did. they did until now they do in a way in a certain way yeah. like the expectations from my brother mm. uh, were bigger than the expectations from me even though they discovered that i was as successful as him later in oh life more. Oh more. no not more he is extremely <laughs> brilliant and successful i don't need to take from the success of someone in order to prove that uh, i'm successful no as well. sibling rivalry. we can all we can all be uh, <laughs> but uh, it was like for example i couldn't go to the movies or anywhere with my friends uh, or visit my friends uh, when i was 15 or 16 but he could, because I was a girl. They were afraid for me. And that's a form of discrimination as well. Mm. Because when your parents are scared about you, okay, it's as if they are telling you, you are vulnerable, you are weak, anything can happen to you. Recently, I wrote an article to, uh, or a, a letter to the Minister of Education asking him to include uh, self-defense in all schools for everyone, for boys and girls, because any child can encounter situations where they need to defend themselves. It's not just about girls, but it's important for girls to also become self-confident physically and know that if something happened, if someone was there to attack them, they can at least try to defend themselves. You mean like judo themselves. or karate? Or yeah, 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 any form of self-defense. There are so many. Or a pepper spray. I don't like pepper spray. Why? I actually like to hurt people if they try to hurt me. <laughs> pepper spray is I'm, never enough. I'm going down. <laughs> that is why I never carry a gun, because I could use it. Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, us Lebanese, we're crazy. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I find that you speak... Uh, number of languages how did that happen uh, and I what grew are the up, languages yeah i grew up um in lebanon which means uh, in most cases you learn french at school yeah. uh, and arabic of course uh, but in my school it was al also english was taught in my school so english french and arabic ever since i was a kid and my grandmother my maternal grandmother was armenian from a country called armenia and uh, she and my mom spoke Armenian together, and I always heard them. And when I was seven years old, this grandmother of mine, which I loved a lot, committed suicide. Oh, yes, because she had survived. I don't know if you heard ever about the Armenian genocides uh, at the times of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Turks killed uh, the Armenians and chased them out of their land. And my, my grandmother was three years old then, and she lost most of her family, and it was devastating. I have just published a novel about this. Uh, so when she died, and I was the first to see her, I told my mother, I want you to teach me her language. I want to speak that language too. And that is how I learned Armenian, just by, with my mother. You know, She spoke to me in Armenian, and we were in a, in a, in a ghetto where Armenian was spoken, so it made things easier for me because I was hearing it all the time in my neighborhood. In Beirut? Yes. Oh. There's an Armenian ghetto called Bush Hamoud where many Armenians uh, went when they came from the different uh, parts of the world to, to seek refuge. And then when I was 15, I fell in love, obviously, finally with someone. That's and early? No. At what? No, that's very early. Yeah, it was early, but mm. no, it wasn't early because I, I'm, I was aware of life and, and matters of the heart at a very young age. So I fell in love with this guy, and this guy studied in Italy. And I thought, because I'm so competitive, so he's going to speak Italian, and I won't speak Italian? No way. And I went and studied Italian because I didn't want him to be better than me. <laughs> It's so funny. <laughs> so we have English, French, 
Arabic, Arabic Armenian, Armenian, Italian. Italian. And then came um, uh, German and Spanish. And now I'm learning Portuguese because oh. I love Brazil. How about Hindi? How about I Malayalam? I would love to, but it seems so difficult. I would love to. I'm sure we and have And you have how many words. languages in India? Oh. How many? How many? <laughs> how many? Like thousands of languages. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, when you speak about freedom, what does it mean to you? The freedom to speak your, your mind? There are different kinds of freedom. Right. And as a person who grew up um, in a place where it was not, uh, you know, a given, where you need to take it, you know, um, I learned that it first needs to start in your head, in your mind. You need to free your mind. And then you free your speech. And then you free your life. To me, it's about owning myself, owning my choices, owning my body, owning my words. It's about being everything and anything that I want to be without having to compromise. Even if I make mistakes, even those, those mistakes They're are your my mistakes. rights. Right. They're my mistakes and no one gets through life without mistakes. Let me make them and pay, pay their pl price gladly. But don't tell me this is something you can do and this is something you cannot do because you are attacking my dignity as a human being and I refuse, I refuse that. Amazing. So what was your first book about? My first, I wrote, my first five books were all poetry books. So poetry, I used to um, love writing poetry, I still do. Uh, and then I uh, wrote um, a play, which was uh, staged as well. Uh, and then I wrote a trilogy of essays, nonfiction, about the situation of women in uh, the Arab world. They are called I Kill Shahrazad, Superman is an Arab, and The Third Sex. And now I have just published my 15th book. It's a novel. It was, it's, it's my first novel. In, in what language? I write in different languages. The children, I also wrote children books. The children books I write in Italian for some reason. I don't know. I think the, the child in me enjoys Italian or speaks Italian. The essays in English, uh, the poetry in Arabic. Uh, I've written short stories in French. And now my first novel, I've written it in English. But I always, even when I write in, in a non-Arabic language, I always insist on publishing the Arabic version first. So they are translated and published in Arabic first and then in all the other languages. Did you marry the Italian? I married him for a few years. I believe in s uh, serial, uh, serial uh, monogamy. Serial? No, not serial <laughs> killing. Serial marriages. I've been married three times. Oh, and, but I did, I did marry him. Yeah? Um, he was my first uh, Children? Husband. My yeah. first husband. Any children? Yes, I have two sons, um, and they are very proud to call themselves feminist, feminist men. Uh, Munir is about to become 27 years old, and Unsi is about Can't to become... Can't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> Can't believe that. 27 years old. Yeah. My goodness. And Unsi is 19. And they both left Lebanon. They love Lebanon? They left Lebanon. Oh, they left Lebanon. Yes. Where, where do you stay now? Uh, I live in Lebanon. I've always lived there because I believe that if I want to contribute in changing or healing some of the problems in the country, it's very important to do it from the inside and not from the you know, comfort of a different city uh, where I would not be experiencing the same problems that the others are. Of the I scene. need to feel yeah. the reality. Yeah. That is why I always refuse to leave, even though I could very easily. But my sons, my two sons, are living now in London. Mm -hmm. uh, Munir is a corporate lawyer. He's working there uh, already, and Unsi is studying sports management. I'm very proud of them, and I would love one day that I would be able to tell them this is a country that deserves you, so please come back. Because it's very sad when young people leave their country. It's really so sad. So apart from writing and uh, putting your, your ideas on paper, is there anything that you can do which would change the situation? Yes. Um, I've been 
a journalist and a writer for a long time, but recently, a few years ago, I became involved in politics, and last year I ran for parliament. And Lebanon is such that I won, oh, and did? the next day I was uh, deprived of my seat. They cheated, and they Just... pretended. And I appealed at the constitutional court because we have lots of uh, proofs that they committed fraud, uh, and I'm still waiting for the decision. You, do not, you cannot be optimistic in a country so corrupt like Lebanon, but I certainly hope that there's enough uh, honesty, integrity, and justice to get my seat back, because as a deputy, I would be able to um, move some laws, you know, that would protect people, that would protect women, that would protect minorities. It's different than the work that I did before as a watchdog, as that's important as well, you know, saying this is wrong, you know, but do, working from the inside is something that I would love to be doing for the next 20 years. How many women are there in your parliament? Uh, only four out of 128 oh. in Lebanon. There are only four women out of one, uh, excuse me, six. We had four. Now with the new parliament, there are six. Okay. So, would any of you like to ask Joanna questions? There's a lady there. Yes. All of them. I don't know. I think all of them, like uh, the doctor here said, because uh, sometimes I, they ask me what language do I dream with. It depends on the dream. Um, I think it's a mixture. Uh, there are so, I think every person is numerous. There are so many people inside us, you know, so many voices. And for me, I've been lucky to have identified seven different languages for the seven different people inside me. But there are also others that speak other languages that I cannot understand. But when I write, it depends. I let myself go. If the idea comes to me in English, I write in English. If it comes in Arabic, I write in Arabic. I don't like to force myself. Freedom. Always freedom. And you give that same freedom to everybody else? Your three, yeah. your three Definitely. husbands? <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. You never should claim something that you do not give. And this is the problem. Like, for example, sometimes in relationships between yeah. men and women, yeah. men take for themselves what they do not allow their wives or their partners to, um, to enjoy. And this is so unfair. If you are aware, then that's fine. As long as they tell you, you need to know and choose. It shouldn't happen, you know, without your knowledge. And most often than not, it happens without your knowledge. What do you say, audience? This is, by the way, this is the word freedom in Arabic. Uh, battle between Christians and Muslims is continuing as a running battle or stopped forever? Secondly, since you are a Christian, I thought Lebanese... I'm not a Christian. You told me yesterday. I'm not a Christian. All I right. was. You belong to a Christian... I'm an atheist. I'm sorry. You belong to a Christian community. It's very westernized. I do not belong to a Christian community. I belong to Lebanon. I do not identify with <laughs> religious communities. <laughs> But I will answer your first question um, uh, regarding uh, the divisions between Christians and Muslims. There will always be tensions. Why? And now it's even between Shia and Sunni uh, inside Islam. Uh, because, <clears throat> like I said at the beginning, in Lebanon you don't have a Lebanese identity. And that is because uh, whenever I want to get married or divorce or inherit, there is no civil status law that applies to everyone. So each person, even those who have no religious um, affiliation, are forced to uh, 
to uh, to belong to a certain community that is why i have such a such a reaction to that because it's the source of the problems and the divisions in lebanon all this i'm an orthodox i'm a maronite i'm a catholic i'm a shia i'm a sunni you have the right to be whoever you are but don't let that be a reason for you to hate those who are different than you or to look at them with disrespect or hurt them or kill them which is what is happening in most parts of the world today and this is the unfortunate part uh, hello uh, i have a couple of clarifications one regarding the title which is living in the country that hates you i want to hear whether it is the state in itself the government in lebanon which is patriarchal or the society at large or the both whether there are two patriarchal setups which enforce one or the other and the second was re regarding the double lives that you spoke that a lot of women live double lives in Lebanon. I want to ask you, in such a patriarchal setup, what, what does a double life entail? Is it a sort of emancipation for a woman or what does it do? I mean, double, how, how, how do you, uh, what's your opinion on double life? Okay, I'm gonna try to remember the second question. If I don't, you will remind me, but regarding, regarding the first question, regarding, yes, uh, the system in itself is patriarchal. So. When I say the system, it means the political scene, the society, people themselves. It's just remember that we have six finally in 2019 and many people considered this as an advancement. We have only six women deputies in our political life and we have just one parliament. Out of 128 people, only six are women. If women are not allowed to participate, if half the population is not allowed to participate in the political decision making, how can you um, uh, expect that society and that system and that government to be uh, not patriarchal? It, it means that even the political leaders, the parties, which in our country, they have to uh, present people to parliament. They have to present, they have to decide who is going to run for parliament. They always choose men. They keep talking about how women are important in the society and how we need them. And they keep saying only one phrase, oh, the woman, our mother, our sister, our daughter, my God, we are so much more than that. Of course, we are mothers and sisters and daughters, but we are also lawyers and, and academics and teachers and pilots and everything. So don't just put us in that category. And that's how, how patriarchal our society is. Regarding the double life, it means like, for example, let me give you one of many examples. A woman should be a virgin when she is married. So many women lead a secret sexual life, but when they want to get married, when they decide enough with having fun, now I want to be a good girl and get married, because they would never find a husband, maybe 10%, I don't like to generalize, 10% of men would agree to marry a non-virgin. For them to find a good husband, which is in many cases the rich husband, unfortunately, they go and get a, a hymen reconstruction at the gynecologist. So they become virgins again. They choose someone, they lie to him, they tell him that they are virgins and they lead, uh, you know, a happy between brackets life. I don't know how they do it. It's about hypocrisy. I understand that they are forced to do it by the society standards, but at some point, you, it is your responsibility to stand up to, to these uh, unjust society standards and say, no, just like you are entitled to a sexual life, I am entitled to a sexual life before marriage, just like you, and I will not marry someone who is so insecure as a man so as not to accept the fact that I had experiences before him. Because at the end of the day, it's about being insecure. If you're insecure in your manhood, you want a virgin. If you don't have a problem and you know that you have chosen a woman because she's a real partner, you don't care about that part of her life. Okay? Jumana, you said you were an atheist. 
Is that really how you feel deep down within you, that there is nothing superior that has created you? I don't, I really, I'm more inclined towards this hypothesis than the other hypothesis. Because, um, you know, uh, I've read a lot of religious literature and I was raised uh, inside the, the, the Catholic system. And I've also read a lot of agnostic um, thinkers, physicists and writers. And personally, and it's a personal choice, I find myself more inclined to uh, the first, to the second category than the first. But then again, I, I must tell you that no one knows. You're not sure. No one knows. No, who, can, knows. who can say for sure? No one knows. That's, that is why I hate extremism, you know, whether it's religious or non-religious, because we're all ignorant at that level. What's important is human ethics. Be good to one another. Be nice. Be kind. Don't hurt each other. Whatever. And then believe whatever you want. In Lebanon and in many Arab countries, I was denied entry because I don't believe in their God. I was denied entry to some countries. But I always tell people, but why judge people, other people, because of their beliefs? Judge them on how they are, what they, uh, what are the, the values that they defend as human beings. Why judge people. them at all? Why judge them at all? But I mean, if you are to judge, take, take humanity as a standard and not being a good or bad Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, whatever. Because every person, every believer tends to believe that oh. their, their oh. religion is the only true religion, which is... I understand religion. It's a need for many people. And sometimes in my moments of weakness, I wish I could believe, but I don't. And this is not something I can control. Uh, Madam, uh, do you remember a few lines of your first poem, Freedom? Um, I remember the first line, my freedom is a dream. What it means, the whole poem, is that there's this dream that I have that is far away and I'm longing to being able finally to achieve that dream. So it's a, it, was, it was even rhymed. I remember when I was little, I used to write with rhymes. So it was, uh, it was about achieving that freedom. And once in, a, in an interview, I said, I hope that my last word on on earth is also freedom because if I would like people to remember me in any way it, it's I would love for them to say free in the beginning just a free soul thank you thank uh, one you. more thing uh, you are in your late 40s 40s uh, do you still uh, believe thank you for reminding me yeah <laughs> very nice of you <laughs> I already said it despite my will to hide it, but fine, okay. go ahead. Okay, do you still think that uh, you are living in the country that hates you? Oh, yes, definitely. As long as people do not learn to accept one another in Lebanon, no matter how different they are, then I will be in a country that hates me. As long as I'm in a country run by a patriarchal government and system, I'm in a country that hates me. Not just me, me and many other uh, women, but also minorities like LGBT or other discriminated against minorities in this country. So when it starts respecting me and all those people, then I won't be living in a country that hates me anymore. But haven't uh, you been <coughs> named as one of the 100 women who are most powerful? In, in an the world. Arabic magazine. Yes, yes. Oh, one of the mo one of the 100 most powerful Arab women in the world. By an Arab magazine. I don't know how powerful I am. Yes, by an Arab magazine. Go figure. Schizophrenia again. <laughs> <laughs> Madam but I'm glad because that's why I do not generalize. Yeah. I'm glad because there are always different, certain different exceptions. Thoughts, yeah. Certain exceptions. One more. Uh, are your works available in English? Uh, yes, everywhere. You can order them via Amazon or um, also uh, as a, as a paperback books. But they're they're everywhere. I I'm not, I'm I'm sure they're not in Indian bookshops. But uh, I hopefully I hope soon. I have one book of my poems translated to one of your languages, but I don't know which language. 
Yeah, I discovered it by, uh, by complete surprise. I didn't know I was translated. And then I find a book with uh, Indian scripture with my face on it. And I asked a friend and they told me. I think this, it was Tamil language. Tamil? Tamil. Yes. Tamil. But Tamil. how could they do it without your... Yes, uh, yes. But it's okay. I'm happy that people are reading my book, even if it's not without my... Uh, knowledge. <laughs> it's fine. <Yeah. laughs> Yes, my, uh, the new one, the first novel, yes, it is available online. Yes. Somebody there. Madam. Uh, Where are you? Here, here. Here, here. First. Oh, okay. <laughs> Was there any discrimination of food within the family, especially during the period of war, uh, there was uh, rationing? Food? Food, food. Food. Yes, was there any food rationing? For you. Discrimination you felt any discrimination? No, in food, no, no, not with my parents. No, they they <laughs> they divided the, the food equally. Uh, next one. Yesterday you said uh, you are coming from a Christian background. Uh? You are coming from a Christian background. Yesterday yes. you said it. Yes. Today you denied. No, because I don't like questions. Because I was sitting outside and some, one person, I don't know if it's if he's here, asked me, "Are you? Oh, you're from Lebanon. Are you Christian or Muslim?" And I really don't know how people can ask these questions. Be careful, she's violent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm violent when necessary, but I'm a very kind person. But who person. knows? <laughs> well, don't step on my toes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that Ma'am, you said uh, greater women participation in parliament. Do you think that would end patriarchy? Because you yourself said yesterday that women are also patriarchal. Yes, but... Even if the women are patriarchal, they have the right to participate. It's not because what is the answer? One friend of mine told me, oh, you're defending this. What if the women that come to parliament are not your kind of women? And I tell him, well, it's their right to be represented. All people with different opinions have the right to be represented, even if they don't think like me. I'm not saying that only, only people who are like me should be in parliament. But with time, with time, it will change. But at least make an equal representation and give women the right to express themselves. Hi. Hey, you. Hi. How safe is it to travel in Lebanon as an independent traveler? You know, the, my question is with reference to a friend of mine who recently visited Beirut. He was told in the hotel that whatever you want to see, go and see at 6 o'clock in the morning. By 10 because by 10 o'clock the bombs go off. <laughs> What? Bombs go off. He was told by the hotel. So that's my question. No, How safe is, is it? To I travel? think your friend is telling you um, a very. <laughs> this is not the case. We don't have bombing in Beirut. Everything's fine. If you go there, we've been voted the country with the most active nightlife in all the world. So that's not our problem. We have a lot of political problems. Yes. We have a lot of uh, tensions because we have um, uh, an armed religious um, uh, party uh, called Hezbollah, but we, we do not have war. We, you can go and visit anytime, and you are welcome. I would love you to visit. Oh, it's like in India, if there's something uh, that happens in Bombay, some incident, then everybody around the embassies in the world will say, dangerous to travel to Delhi. Yeah, I told them yesterday at yeah. my event, my mom's first words to me when I was about be to careful. come here, be careful, they will rape you. So I was, um, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Mom, don't be scared. And she told my partner, because my husband is with me, don't let her out of your sight. She's like, now what? What's gonna happen? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> hello, hello ma'am. Where? Here. Hi. Uh, Ma'am, what do you think would be the consequences if a woman, a Lebanese woman, decided to stand up to the system there? Or what are the consequences that you have had to face? Oh, it's, um, it's a consequence that, for me, has been very easy to deal with because of one decision. The decision not to give any importance to what others are saying about you. Because when you start standing up for yourself, you will be called a whore, a slut, a prostitute, a bad woman, uh, someone who's going to corrupt uh, everyone, whatever. But when you decide, I don't care what they're going to say. 
this is the price. I don't care. I want to live the way I want to live, and I'm not going to allow them. And then when you do that and don't care, they start fearing you. They are scared of you. They become scared of you because they think, oh, how is it possible that we are insulting her in public and she's not giving us any, you know, she's not scared, she's not intimidated. And they start thinking that maybe you have some kind of power, you know. It's so stupid, it's so, but it's about standing up for yourself. But before doing that, it's also important to remember that you need to be financially independent because you don't, you don't want to be blackmailed with money at some point in your life, you know? So do whatever you need to do in order to be independent, in order for no one to tell you, you will do this because I'm feeding you, I'm clothing you, I'm putting you in a house, I own you. When you are financially independent, then you truly choose a person because you love them, because they are a real partner and not because you need someone to rely on in your life. I have a question. The women who live the lives they want to live, and then duplicity, they marry somebody for his money. Are they then happy, or they, do they turn to drugs as in some cases over here? I actually cannot know, but I can never imagine being in such a situation because I would be extremely miserable if I married someone only because they have money. My three husbands have no money, so I'm glad I'm... Uh, you support them? We support each other. We, nice. we, we participate. Beautiful. This is how it should be. It's yeah. a real partnership. Uh, but um, yes, often, most often than not, I even don't feel that there's a purpose in their life. It's mm. like their purpose is a Chanel bag and that's it. Or their purpose is a Porsche car, you know, one of those fast cars and that's it. But what's after that? I once was with my son. He was then 14 maybe or 13, my youngest son at a birthday. And one of his friends in the, in the class, a girl, I hear her telling, my, I hear her, telling her, her uh, classmates, when I grow up, see that yellow, you know, sports car over there? When I grow up, I'm going to tell my husband to buy me one. And I turn to her and I tell her, dear Elsa, wouldn't it be so much nicer for you to grow up and work and be successful and buy that car for yourself instead of... But this is how her mother raised her. That's the thing that makes me go crazy. It's how sometimes mothers are still raising their daughters to belittle themselves, to disrespect themselves, to think that they are a commodity that can be sold for the highest bidder. So from the home to the school, in education, do you have co-ed uh, children studying together? Or they're separate girls and separate boys' schools? In my education, yes. They, we were just a girls' school mm -hmm. uh, with nuns. I wish no one to have this, uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this destiny because it's very difficult to be in a school run by nuns, mm -hmm. uh, Catholic nuns. But um, uh, That's why you thought she was Christian. Yeah. yeah, but then uh, my, uh, at my, when, my, when I had my own sons, I decided to put them in a secular mixed schools, even though those schools still exist, schools for boys, to school for girls, but there are also mixed secular schools, and that's where there they are. had their... That's progressive. Yes, itself. yes, yes, yeah. we have those schools. Oh, great. Okay, one more question. Do you believe in ghosts? <laughs> no, no, I do not. I do not. But I hate horror movies. They make me uncomfortable. Why? I don't know those about exorcism, and I don't know why. I don't like them. I prefer to watch, you know, comedy or thrillers or action movies, but I do not like uh, the horror movies. I think there's enough horror around us in the world to, to, uh, to last for two lifetimes. So. so recently we spoke about. Writing noir, maybe some of the writers are here. Writing noir, where you write depressive things. Mm. I mean, people, whether it helps them or whether it's cathartic, nobody seems to know. Would you believe in that sort of writing? It's supposed to be reality. Yes. Uh, 
let me tell you something. When I was growing up, there was this cliche about the poet and the writer that they're always sad and miserable and contemplating the horizon and tear with tears in their eyes. I understand that uh, suffering, emotions, emotions generates, create, yeah. suffering generates strong words, but before everything else, you need to have talent. If you don't have talent, even if you write the saddest or the most joyful story in the world, it has no, it has no value. So for me, as long as a person is genuine and talented and writing, even if they're writing a very sad reality, they needed to do it. And someone out there, when they read it, they might feel like they, they were helped because of it. So let it be, you know? Why not? Why not write a realistic well, story? I feel there's enough grim reality in the world why would you want to read more and more about it even in fiction? Because sometimes it makes you feel not alone. Because if you wrote about a sad reality that you ha are facing, and I read about it and I was facing something similar, it will make me feel less alone. And that in itself is a huge, you know, it's, it's very important. I mean, let the people decide what is worthy and not worthy. As long as it's true literature, it doesn't matter what, what the subject is. But I is. still like a happy ending. Yeah, happy ending. <laughs> oh. Happy endings. <laughs> okay, you're a romantic, that's fine. No, why not? Good for you. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I think we've had a beautiful interactive session with, with our audience over here. Thank you, Ola. Thank you.